Yeah, there we are. So, uh, hello, I'll step out into the light. Ding! Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Jez, um, and I used to live up the road there when the Norfolk and Norwich was still a hospital. It's very convenient, if you're real. Um, um, <laughs> I'm currently... Now, I don't know where you go now. If I fall ill now, I don't know it. Oh, it's, ugh, rubbish. Anyway, um, I'm currently a, a software granddad at the West Midlands Fire Service. Uh, and I'm a kind of software developer come researcher for a thing called the Archangel Project, and it's um, Archangel that I'm here to talk about today. Um, so we live in kind of interesting times. Um, a truth, uh, objectivity, uh, plain old facts, they're all, they all seem to be up for grabs. They can be, you know, they're incomplete or they're misleading or they're based on alternative facts uh, or increasingly uh, just dismissed as as fake news, and this is from earlier this year, the New Yorker magazine sent a, a journalist to a flat earth conference. And <laughs> it's an amazing article. Uh, and these, these guys, these flat earthers, they all had, they didn't have a shared understanding of a flat earth, but they would generally agree that the earth was not round, and it wasn't a flat disc moving through space, because those nutters were at a different conference, it's just a flat disc that's still, <laughs> right, for some reason, to, uh, to do with the Jews or something. It was very strange. And it just had this wonderful, wonderful quote. This, this guy, this genuine quote from his article, facts are not true just because they're facts. Right? So these, these guys, these flat earth guys, claim to be kind of clear-eyed empiricists, that they see the truth, right? And they say, for example, if, if the world was round, right, then an aeroplane... Would, it would have to constantly be adjusting its course down. Because otherwise, if the, if the world is round and the aeroplane is flying level, it's just going it's, right? So if you fold down your tray table and put a spirit level on the tray, you should be able to see the little bubble bubbling up towards you, but you can't, right? So there, boom, boom busted, Illuminati revealed. Okay. It's nonsense, right? We can, there are all kinds of easy experiments that we can do, and we have been doing for the last, well, throughout recorded history, that demonstrate that um, uh, the world is, is not frisbee-shaped. Allegedly. No, no. no. <laughs> we can be quite sure about this. So anyway, so they, they did this, this uh, article, and here's Flat Earth saying, well, one, ha one has to wonder about the state of our mainstream media when staunch empiricism is described as post-truth. So, so these guys are saying that actually, that, so, I, so it's not just this article is wrong. This is, this is kind of the interest of the, the, the point of this particular poll quote, is that it's not just this article that's wrong, it's the whole of mainstream media that we need to be suspicious of, of everything. And so these are these kind of interesting times to live in. Does anyone know... The, the, uh, you're familiar with this phrase, may you live in interesting times, right? Yeah. Where does this come from? Chinese. It does fake news, my friend. That is fake news. It, it's, it doesn't come from that at all. From no, no. It comes from a chap uh, called Austin Chamberlain. So Austin Chamberlain, he was a British diplomat in the 30s, uh, son of Joseph, brother of the simultaneously more and less successful Neville uh, Chamberlain. Um, <laughs> And he used this phrase in a speech in 1936. And, and he used, he may even have, I can't, I can't remember, I didn't write it down. Uh, he, I think he may have used it in this, uh, in, as, a, as a kind of, a, that it's used as a curse. He may have said that it's used as a curse. Um, and his father, Joseph, also uh, used similar phrasings, but in a more positive way, that these are interesting times to live in and that's good, uh, in speeches that he gave in uh, 1898 and 1901. There were more positive times there at the end of the, the old Victorian period. So yeah. how do we know this? How do we know that this is the case and it's not a, an ancient Chinese curse? We know this through the use of um, documentary archives, right? In this case, the Yorkshire Post and the, uh, the Western Daily Press, Western Daily Press in, uh, for Austin and Joseph, respectively. And so when we talk about the archives of the Yorkshire Post and the Western Daily Press, we're talking, of course, about boxes and boxes of newspapers. Okay? And these are lovely physical things that we can look at. We can take them out. We can read them. We can see them in their context because there's yesterday's paper and there's something in today's paper that refers to that one. And there's a thing, there's something in tomorrow's paper, tomorrow's paper, time traveling, tomorrow's paper that refers back to that one. And we can, 
when we read these papers, we know that we are reading the same papers that people were reading in 1936 or 1898 or, or whatever. And it's not just newspapers, of course. If any of you do like genealogical research, you'll have been in church records and wills and probates and all that kind of stuff, right? We've got these big paper archives. And physical records from the past are great like that because they're we can rely on them because they're extremely difficult to tamper with without detection, and they're almost impossible to forge. It's just, it's really difficult, really difficult. But paper, of course, and vellum and papyrus, whatever, isn't, it isn't ideal. It isn't ideal. Anyone know what this is? BBC hmm? Is that the BBC article? No. It's an archive after a fire. Isn't it? An archive after a fire? You, 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 I was going to say, you're getting warmer. Go on. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Norwich Library, thank you. Thank you. You see, I work for this, but I just did my homework. Um, so paper, paper isn't, isn't super durable. Right? A lot of paper is it's, it's quite cheap and just kind of falls apart with age. Anyway, it's also quite, quite flammable. So Norwich, of course, is a famously old city. There's a chunk of the... That's not the Roman wall, is it? But there's a chunk of something quite old. Just, just out that window there. It's the, uh, the friary. Right. We're in white friary. Of course we are, yes. Um, looks like they would probably fall in the river if they went through that door anyway. Um, so... Uh, it's, hmm? it's also a pokey stop. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. So Norwich, a, a fine city. Um, although perhaps not uh, quite as important now as it was uh, once was. Uh, and, but it has this, this very rich history. And the, the library's archive, uh, before this event, had documents that extended back to about 1090, which is about as early as we go with, with written archives in this country, so it's after the, the conquest. And a big ch a chunk of that archive was lost in 1994 when the library caught fire in a gas explosion. And there was something like 100,000 books in the kind of main collection that were lost. And a big chunk of the, the, the archive was lost as well. Although it wasn't lost in a fire, actually, because it was in lovely fireproof vaults that were in the basement, that filled full of water, oh. and all the firemen were trying to put the fire out. <laughs> at the wheel, the, the library had just been refurbished at the time, actually, and they didn't put a sprinkler system in because they thought, well, what happens if the sprinklers go off? If there's a little fire and the sprinklers go off, we're going to lose a lot of documents. And they had a fucking great big fire. It wasn't good. So, I mean, some of the things that were lost, and I, which I think includes uh, the city's original charter document signed by Richard I, are, they're, they're kind of, his, they're interesting historical artefacts, right? But they don't necessarily tell us things we didn't know. But there are other records that were lost, uh, including, I found this example, of the American Air Division Memorial Library, okay? Which was uh, a record of what American airmen did in Norfolk during the Second World War. And we assume it's, you know, seducing the local ladies and then buggering off home again. But we don't know, and now we'll never know, because those records have been lost. Okay? There's a, so there's a hole, as a result, there's a hole in the kind of the history of the city and, and consequently the country and, and more widely. So, the solution to flammable, fragile documents is digital, right? It's lovely, we, we scan them all. And we store them on these enormous disk arrays. This is actually a Huawei disk array, so it's probably all being stolen by the Chinese government. But anyway. Back, backed up. Backed up, yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, <laughs> backed up. Backed up to the cloud. Yeah. Right? Off-site backup. Off backup. So, well, the, no, this is, this is important, right? So if, we, if we, we have these digital documents, we can copy them perfectly across multiple sites, and we laugh in the face of fire and flood, right? Ha-ha! But the problem with digital documents is that they are super easy to forge, right? Oh, there's one. You don't know what the provenance of that is. I've just pulled it out of my, my back pocket. And they're very easy to, to tamper with. Tamper with if you're being malicious or, or alter, inadvertently alter. Just, you know, you know, you open a Word document and Word does stuff to it without you just when you look at it, right? So, digital's great, but mm, no, okay. So, uh, when I talk about documents in this talk, I'm talking about anything, really. So, text and pictures and artwork and video and sound recording, and just any kind of digital artifact. 
And we, so we can store these things, and the, you know, the physical media might be subject to degradation, but we can solve that just by copying it again, right, and coming again, and we can check some of them, and we can and all that. But the issue with digital documents is this one of authenticity. So, so it's topical. <laughs> so, after the, the Trump inauguration, when people are on the news going, there are many people there, the National Park Service released a picture that was kind of that little section. It might even have been a bit smaller than that. And they said, look, loads of people. Loads of people there. And it turned out that this was more like the case. This is the case. This is the Trump inauguration. And this is the crowd for the Obama inauguration. And we can see, by kind of simple inspection, that these are taken from more or less the same vantage point at the end of the National Mall. And we're told, it says a combination of photos, shows the crowd attending the inauguration, inauguration ceremony as Donald Trump, Barack Obama. So we're told that these are taken at approximately the same kind of time during the proceedings. We can see the weather's kind of similar, so it's not that people have stayed at home because it's raining or anything. So why, why do we trust that these are true representations of what went on? And why do we think that Sean Spicer saying, I don't want to get this wrong. It's important I read this so I don't misquote him. I think that's given the... Anyway. Um, <laughs> Sean Spicer said, uh, Trump drew the largest audience ever to witness an inauguration, period, both in person and around the globe. You're not taking into account the fact that the Trump photo has the white protective layers on the grass, which makes the crowd look thinner. Why do we disbelieve Trump? <laughs> why, do we, why do we believe these? These are photos from Reuters. <laughs> You're sculling it. So, we trust Reuters. We trust Reuters. Yes, we do. We don't trust Trump because he just, the only, probably the only thing he ever says that's true is his name, right? <laughs> Whereas, I should probably declare, I used to work for Reuters, although not in the news uh, department. Um, the, we, we trust Reuters because we recognise them as a reliable news agency. We don't need to know the, the kind of the history of the organisation necessarily. It goes back to about 1850. We don't need to know, for example, that during the war they resisted UK government attempts to uh, present, I forget, what was the phrase? Have I got it here? Better serve the national interest. So they resisted. Lying. Yeah. And that's now enshrined in the way they operate. Um, so we don't need to know that. It helps Perhaps that we know that, but we don't need to know that to, to recognise that we can we probably trust Reuters in a way that we don't, <laughs> unbelievably, trust the President of the United States. So it's not just the document itself that's important, it's the, where it comes from, it's the provenance of the document that's important. It's where, who vouches for it, and, and, and can we rely on them when they say this, is, this thing is the thing that it purports to be. So the example I've given here, the example I just gave, is kind of easily resolved because it's a contemporaneous photo and we can debunk it more or less in real time. But what about documents which aren't from right now? So uh, records, we, we have a lot of uh, records, government records particularly, that are held, uh, that are sealed, closed in archival speak, for a period of time. Typically now 20 years, used to be 30 there are some things like census records that are held for 100 years. So but if I produce something after 100 years, that could be anything, right? Especially if we've had a climate in which the, the um, authority of these institutions has been systemically undermined. So... If institutional trust is undermined, we can't give these things any credence. I've, I've got an example for you here, Russell. You know, if I produce a bunch of PDFs in a few years labelled what Tony Blair did in the war, in the Iraq war, depending on your point of view, you might say, well, this demonstrates that Tony Blair is a war criminal. Or you might go, well, these could be any old documents. We don't know where they've come from. So they're just a bunch of bits, right? So Archangel... And it's quite grandiose, but I mean, Archangel is aiming to avert that future. The point of the project is to try and avert that future. Right? Um, we're trying to save society just from dissolving into a formless goo of untrustworthiness. 
So, the Archangel project proposes to deliver long-term sustainability of digital archives through new technologies that will ensure both accessibility to and integrity of digital <coughs> archives. That's, that's project speak. That's, that's the, the, the phrase we've got. It sounds quite portentous and serious. I don't know why Archangel is all caps, but it, cause it's a bit creepy, <coughs> I think. Bit, I mean, Archangel as well has kind of like Soviet Russia overtones, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> which, which, which again it runs counter to the whole trust motif we're, we're trying to set up. Anyway, there we are. So, um, the, the guy in the, in the white suit in Airwolf, you know, he may well have been, yes. Oh, now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think he was all caps. No, 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 no. no. I, you're not mixing him up with Michael from, uh, from Knight Rider, are you? No, I don't exactly. no not Michael, Devon. No, he, he wore a white suit all the time. I'll, I'll Okay, you, you look that up for us and we'll, we'll come back to you. Bear, bear in mind the source of this information, okay? Yes. The problem is important. Anyway, so Archangel uh, is a collaboration between the uh, University of Surrey CVSSP, the Computer Vision Speech and Signal Processing Centre, the National Archives and the Open Data Institute, and it's funded by the Research Council's UK's Digital Economy Programme through the, I should have edited that slide, the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council. And I don't know if I have to tell you that, but I think now I have, we can tick it off on some kind of what we did to publicise the project thing. So, Archangel Project is about... Uh, so, what do we mean by this thing here? By long-term sustainability, we mean that we want to try and ensure that the public trust in archives can be maintained over not just over years, but over potentially over decades, because that's the lifetime of these, of these records. Uh, and we, it just says digital archives, because if you start with digital documents, it's, it's, it's easier than having to have, have people scan things beforehand. Um, and it's only a two-year project, not, you know, got to give it a bit of limit. Uh, and we're going to do this through the application of new technologies. Deep breath. And those new technologies are the blockchain and machine learning. You're missing drones, um, <coughs> chatbots. Look, <laughs> careful now, careful now. <laughs> you know, and if you think I, I look like a, if you think I look like an old man trying to stay up with a, keep up with the cool kids, you won't until you see Russell. Oh, um. <laughs> So, so we're going to do it with these, with these <laughs> hip new technologies. No, I'm sorry, that was completely unwarranted, Russell, and I do apologise. Um, at least I have hair. <laughs> I've got mine in a drawer at home. I've got mine in a drawer at home. So are there any blockchain experts in the room? Are there any machine learning experts in the room? Apparently. <laughs> Careful now. Okay. Uh, given that I've told you nothing about what we're doing, anyone want to have a stab at what we're doing with those two things? Almost and no. Okay, so let's give you a bit of, bit of this is a very unfair question. Let's give you a bit of context. So this, this is the National Archive uh, in... Q. Yes, that's right. That's right. And if you're an ordinary member of the public, you go and throw those doors and you go that way into this lovely concrete thing. Looks a bit like the University of Hull Library. And if you go... Niche reference. Niche reference. If you go that way, then you're, you're in with the archivist. I don't know where... I think they, they might store some stuff here, but a lot of it's held in a, like in a salt mine somewhere, and they've got a big site near Oxford, I think, the dark archives. You can't go in and poke around. I mean, I know people who've worked there for 10 years have never actually seen the archive, because you're, you're not allowed in. So uh, this is the National Archive, and it's the official archive of the UK government, and for England and Wales. There's also a National Archive for Scotland, and there's a public records office in Northern Ireland that perform the, the same function. And all government records are retained by the archive. Um, and it also has got a statutory role overseeing custody of some other things uh, and because of its history, because it's existed in some form for hundreds of years uh, and the importance of the documents it retains and the, the, uh, the function it, it kind of serves, um, it's got a leading role in archive policy not just in Britain but, but around the world. So I don't know why I look there because it's still the same slide. Uh, so it's got like court records from like 12th century onwards, it's got uh, central government records from medieval period onwards, um, like basically doomsday book on, right? It's got um, criminal records, naturalisation records, armed forces, service and operational records, foreign office, colonial office correspondence, cabinet office, home office, railway records, all kinds of stuff. So 
organisations like or institutions like the National Archive, um, and uh, uh, we can think of other examples like the Bodleian Library, for example, in this country, or the Smithsonian Institute, or the Library of Congress, or the Rijksarchiv in um, in the Netherlands. Um, they uh, use the term uh, memory institution or archival and memory institution uh, because they, they are like the custodians of the nation's uh, history. Um, and they take that extre extremely seriously. Um, and as you might imagine, the people who work here, at least all the ones I've met, are discomforted at best <laughs> by, uh, by the, the current state of... Uh, public discourse. Um, they don't have sprinklers, by the way. You've got big argon fire suppressants. If that place catches fire, you are dead. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> dead. Do they not have the masks? I, I, maybe because I haven't been in the archive. I haven't seen them around the place. No, but that's, <laughs> you, you're gone. So they've got a huge collection, um, and it's only getting bigger. Uh, in the good old days, documents for archiving arrived in boxes, boxes full of paper. Now they arrive in boxes full of two terabyte hard drives. And those hard drives are processed by hand. Okay, so let's have a quick archival primer. When the stuff arrives, um, obviously we've got the things that we're archiving and we have some information about it. So the, where it's come from, the originator, the author, maybe the copyright holder, um, what other thing, which other documents it relates to. Uh, and that is what we call a submission information package. And the person who's giving it to you should have done all that work, but the archive, they, they're not, generally they're unreliable, as I understand it, so the archive will verify that stuff. Uh, and that's why there's this little kind of up-down loop here. On the, the, the slide that I was shown for the process, actually, they use, there are like 15 stages you go through here, and they've all got a, let's go back and do it again. So we, we've got the, the thing that we're archiving, and then the, inf the metadata, the information about it. And when we've finally decided that the metadata is right, then we, f we form an archival information package, and that's the thing that's actually stored in the archive. It's the document, or the collection of documents, and the information about it. And we've got some extra metadata coming in here, because it's like, where are we keeping it? And how is it catalogued? And, and all that kind of stuff. And then the thing that's available to members of the general public is called a dissemination information package, a DIP, which might be the same as the archival information package, but it might be different. And it might be different for a variety of reasons. It might be uh, different because we can't release all of this, or we can't release all of this yet. Or it might, so it might be redacted in some way, it might be completely withheld. You might know something about it, but you might not know all of it. Or it might be reformatted. So a lot of what the, um, if you go to the National Archive website and you search for something, they will give you a PDF <coughs> of, of a thing regardless of whether that thing was, if that was a photo, they'll give it to you as a PDF. Because PDF, most people can look at a PDF. So it might be reformatted in, in some way. So these are the three main things. This is the <coughs> OAIS model, and I've forgotten what that means. Um, anyway, so you've got the SIP and the AIP and the, and the DIP. So, <laughs> yes, I've said all that. So, you're an archival your archival and memory institutions, you're receiving tons and tons of documents. Public discourse is undermining trust in your institution. You think, I know, I'll use the blockchain. And normally when people say, I know, I'll use the blockchain, we can all run for the doors. Um, but maybe the blockchain might be the right solution here, or maybe a not wrong solution here. So what is it about blockchains that make me say that? So blockchains basically, a distributed database that's append only it guarantees the provenance of the information on the chain and it can give those guarantees without a reliance on a, on a centralised guaranteeing authority, if you like. So, and that seems to run slightly counter to me saying, well, here's the National Archive saying, here's this thing, and I'm saying that we can use this because it doesn't have that central authority. Well, come on. We'll come on to that. So a blockchain is kind of database. It's a very slow, <laughs> write-only database, but it can provide these guarantees. Uh, and we can say that this particular data was written at this time by this person or by this address, um, and this data is as it was. Okay? It can't be altered, 
and if an attempt is made to alter it, then, then everyone will see it. So data in blockchain is stored in blocks, and the reason it's a, that's why it's called a, that's a, that's a block part of the blockchain, and the reason it's a chain is because each block encodes, typically has a hash, of the previous block. And so I can only calculate the value for this block, which has um, some transaction, some data of some sort written into it. These, these I'll talk about how, how this arrived at in a moment. But we have some data that's being written into the block, and that block can only be <coughs> formed, and you can only verify that block if you know what the previous block was. And you can only verify that one if you know what the previous block was. And you can only verify that one if you know what the previous, and so on and so on, back to the first block, typically called the genesis block. So if you were all to whip out your laptops now and download a Bitcoin client, don't recommend it, download a Bitcoin client, the first thing it would do is connect into the Bitcoin network and it would start downloading the Bitcoin blockchain from the beginning. And as it downloaded, it would probably be downloading them from several different places to make sure that they, they're all in sync. And as it downloaded each block, it would be rerunning the calculations, the hashes and things on that block to verify that it was the thing that it said it was. And then it can move on to the next one, and then it can move on to the next one. And then maybe in like two weeks' time, you'll be in a position where you can spend £5,000 to get a fraction of a Bitcoin that you don't know what to do with. Brilliant. Anyway, so... <laughs> How can we use this property to secure our archive? So when this talk was first announced, somebody, possibly here, uh, out yourself, uh, emailed me. Oh, I couldn't find the email. I looked up earlier this week. I'm sorry. Uh, emailed me about a blockchain-based distributed, distributed storage system and said, I'm sure you're aware of this distributed storage, storage system. It seems to be right in your you know, wheelhouse. And, and I didn't reply, actually, because I thought it was going to be here anyway. Anyway, I don't, you, you kind of, so you, the distributed storage system is you throw your content onto the blockchain, it's magically distributed across the world, you know, and it's all safe there forevermore. That is not what we're doing with the, with the archival stuff. Um, first of all, there's, there's just the volume, because we're talking about like petabytes of stuff, it's just not practical. And also, because I've just talked about the fact that some of this stuff is held closed for a period of time. But sometimes that closed status can change. So it might be that something's initially open and then is closed later by some change in policy or some subsequent event that casts that original document in a new light. So you have to, but if it's already on a blockchain, you can't retract it. It might also that it starts closed and is open because of something like a freedom of information request. So the status of the open and closed can change. So we don't want to store the, the documents on a blockchain but instead we write that metadata, we write like a document fingerprint. So we can do like a, you know, a file hash and you know, you could, you could come up with this stuff now, a file hash and a file type and a creation date and like for zip files and tar balls and stuff like that, we can do the hash of the zip file and the hash of the individual contents and we can maintain that directory structure and all that kind of stuff. So that's um, what we do. So that's what we're doing. We're kind of taking the, the metadata of our documents and we're going to pop it into the blockchain and that then is, is fixed. And if we do that at the SIP stage, if we do that as soon as we get it, then you can track that stuff even before it's archived. So then the, the, the National Archive can say to you, look, this is the stuff we received and then you can see that the stuff it received actually then went into the archive because we can update this, we can write like a new record that said, oh, you remember that thing that we had over here? Well, now we know some more stuff about it. So you can update records, but you can still see the whole, the whole history of it, the whole log of any given document. So if we capture that, the, that uh, file information, those, that file fingerprint, as soon as it arrives, then you can follow it right through the archival process, and you can be reassured that the things that are in the archive are the things that were given to the archive. We can't go back any further than that, because that's... Because one of the things about the blockchain, right? People tell you, oh, it'll, it'll help, we can help with voting, or it can help with... Irish border. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? But, yeah, yeah, right? People are saying, they're, they're saying, don't worry, we can solve the Irish border problem with a fucking blockchain. We can't, because the only thing the blockchain can tell you is the stuff that's on the blockchain. So if I write a thing on my blockchain saying, oh, yes, I've just transported 
you know, four tankers of milk from my farm in the north to my dairy in the south. I've got no way to actually guarantee that four tankers actually cross because we have a, like a long history of, of VAT fraud over the Irish border, right? Because people filled out a piece of paper that said that they'd... <laughs> so, the, it can't give you absolute trust, but what we can do is say, well, this is the stuff, and this is when we got it, and then we did this with it, and then we did this with it, and then we did this with it, and then we filed it away. And then in 100 years' time, you can say, can I have that thing? And you go, yeah, here it is. And we fingerprinted it by calculating this hash sum and this hash and this hash, and you can rerun those hashes, recalculate them yourself. You can verify, assuming we're all still alive and the blockchain is still running, you can verify that evidence in this tamper-proof distributed ledger, and you can be confident the thing I have produced for you is the thing that originally came in and originally went into the archive. So that's the theory. It's quite simple. All we need now is a worldwide cooperating network of archival memories. Okay. So, um, you can, so yes, you can be satisfied the documents produced also went in. Go on. with the original document. Yes. You only know that that's the case. You don't know what Yes, but is. even that would be bad, right? Well, it would, but if someone's done it, someone's done it. Everyone. Yes, but if that, if that happened, then you can detect it, whereas okay. currently... Who knows, right? I'm not, I, I do have faith in the archive, by the way. The people who work there are fantastic. But it's, that's no good me telling you that, right? <laughs> but yeah, so if it, if it had been tampered with, you could tell it had been tampered with, but we wouldn't be able to kind of error recover it. We wouldn't be able to say why it had been tampered with or when or come back. Excuse me. But you would know. And that would, be, that would be important. So, we have a little proof of concept uh, running. We run it on the Ethereum uh, network using a smart contract. Uh, and it's a permissioned network. So, uh, anyone here familiar with Ethereum? Heard of Ethereum? Okay. What, what is it about Ethereum that makes it more interesting than most of the other blockchains? There are about 2,000 cryptocurrencies, by the way. Do not waste your money on any of them. Um, anyone want to have a stand, but why Ethereum? Why are we using Ethereum? Because you can actually encode the smart the because, contract. Because you can do this, this smart contract. Um, Ethereum, an Ethereum client, um, so most things, like the, the kind of classical blockchain, the, the Bitcoin thing, um, is just about, all you can do basically is move, is say, I want to send a bit of my coin to this address. And you, you can tag a little bit of kind of commentary on that, but you can't really do anything else. So it's not really useful for encoding quantities of data because you, you, it's really hard to find stuff again. Um, probably also illegal actually to download the Bitcoin client because of what people have tagged in there. Anyway, whereas Ethereum, um, it's, it's more interesting because it, has, it supports what they call smart contracts, which is a horrible misnomer, horrible, <laughs> horrible misnomer, which is basically a jumped up way of saying programs on the blockchain. The original idea of this smart contract was that you could somehow encode like a big, a, an actual legal contract on the blockchain and that would somehow be enacted. And if, as I sort of worked for Reuters earlier, I was working in legal publishing, not a hope, not a hope. The whole point of contracts is to, for, they're a starting point for discussion. <laughs> they really, there's no way you can go. But anyway, so have these smart contract things. So Ethereum embeds a virtual machine and you can deploy programs onto the blockchain and they form a part of the transaction of a block. And they can, and they, these, the, once you've deployed the, con the contract, the program, it has an address of its own and then you can call methods on that contract. And when you call those methods, they form part of the transaction of a subsequent block. Okay, so you're, you're getting people to do computation on your behalf. And there's a mechanism, but and you can imagine, you can immediately go, well, I could denial a service that just into the ground, right? But the, the mechanism to prevent that is that calling these methods has a cost. So each kind of virtual opcode has a, has a price, has a difficulty associated with it, and that's mapped to a, to a price that you pay in Ether. 
or gas, we call it. So the, the more computation you want to do, or the more data you want to work with, the, the higher the cost. So it's kind of limiting like that. So as a, but as a memory institution where I'm dealing with these vast volumes, I don't want to be fucking around on public infrastructure, paying real money for a frankly unreliable network, which could at any moment, you know, because the, 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 these contracts are dynamically priced. So if the network is busy, they cost more. And obviously, if the network is quiet, they cost less. And the, the spikes on the network are, pfft, you, you know, uh, anyone have uh, crypto kitties? It's big with the kids, big with the kids just before Christmas last year. And it's an online trading, basically a trading card game on the blockchain. So the idea is, <coughs> like, you got ki you're, you're a Pokemon man, you've got kids play Pokemon, and they're all after the Charizard GX, for example, you know? So Nintendo, they can print up some more Charizard, Charizard GXs, right? But if it's on the blockchain, there's only a limited number of these little kitties, right? And then you get your kitty, and you get somebody else's kitty, and then you can breed them, and then you get new kitties that you can sell to other people for actual money. Nearly, nearly brought this network to its knees. I kid you not, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that was a big sigh, wasn't it? That was like, oh my God, people are so stupid. So stupid. So we don't want to have any, any truck with those idiots, right? Well, we're trying to do important work. So we set up our own network. Um, the, oh, this, by the way, this is, what, uh, uh, this is a bit of a smart contract. This is quite easy. This is a language called Solidity. Uh, so uh, this is a very bad example as well, actually, because I'm using strings. But anyway, so we've got a method, and you see that's external. And I've got a little um, restriction on there, so that says permitted. So only people who have, only addresses that have permission to write to this method can actually invoke it. Anybody else just gets kicked off. And I'm uh, looking up something in my, this is like, just, it's a key value pair. That's all I'm looking up here. And if I had something, then I create a little kind of single link list. And then I can do this thing, I can emit an event. And in my client, I can, I can catch those events. So as these events are raised, you could have a little client sitting over here, and there could be work happening over there, and those events would be emitted, and you could catch them. Because the way you actually want to work with the data here is you capture those events that are coming out, and then you store them in a database so that you can easily query them. <laughs> that's so anyone does any sen anything sensible with it. So, right. So rather than run this public infrastructure, um, we set up our own Ethereum network, um, and because we don't want the planet to burn, we don't use proof of work, which is basically everybody competing by shouting random numbers at each other. We use a thing called the proof of authority. So I think that's a poor choice of name, but it maybe applies in this case. So when you create your network, uh, it's very easy. There are loads of online tutorials. Um, you can, uh, in, a, in a normal blockchain network, coins, the cryptocurrency, it's a a product, a rewards for creating new blocks. So they're the, the incentive for people to actually do the work. In a proof of authority network, you create just a pool of have a virtual cash at the beginning, your virtual pot of gold, and you can just hand it out however you like to arbitrary addresses. And at the same time, you can you define a clique, what's called a clique, and those are the only nodes, the only addresses rather, that can create new blocks. So there's still a consensus mechanism. They still have to agree on what that new block is, but they're not competing. So you don't have to have 97 graphics cards wired together because you're trying to outrace someone in China. So the your computing cost comes down. But other nodes can still participate and, and in the network, and they can still see what's going on. And this fits our kind of use case very well, because these could be our AMIs. And these could be, th this is kind of, you know, the general public. These could be uh, uh, civic kind of, civic society organisations or tinfoil hatters or whatever you like who are watching what's, what's going on. So, uh, da, 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 da. so, and, you know, if you were a, a tinfoil hat wearing type, you might argue with, you say, well, what's, what's to stop these organisations colluding to rewrite the past? You, you, say, well, you, you can't really guard against that, but it would require kind of unprecedented levels of cross-border cooperation. And if it was ever detected, which, given that everybody's watching, or 
potentially people watching would be detected, then, the, then the, whole, the whole thing is up, right? That everybody's immediately undermined themselves. So the whole thing would collapse. So they're kind of hopefully locked in like a fatal embrace of trust, which is a strange phrase to write down. Anyway, does that make reasonable sense? I appreciate I've raced through this really quickly. Does that make reasonable sense? OK. So where does machine learning fit in? Good question. Glad you asked. So if we go back to this, I said um, we might reformat things at this point. And if we're talking about things 20 years hence, 40 years hence, 100 years hence, it's entirely possible that my original document is no longer readable. Right? Word star. AVI. Is anyone still use AVI? I don't know. But probably the original format is no longer readable. So if I give it to you and say, well, look, here's, here's the thing, you can check some it and go, well, that's the same file, but how do I know that this version that you've given me to look at is a true representation of that? And I could say, well, look, when I format shifted it here, I made a little note in my ledger and I checked some of it again, but I could have tampered with it at that point, inadvertently or otherwise, right? So, we use machine learning. Russell, as a, are you a former professor or still a current professor? Is it a former. former professor? But you will have immediately, immediately identified this as a part of the project where the PhD is, right? Okay, so... <laughs> Okay, no, but sort of you're, you're familiar with the idea that we can train a neural network. We show it lots of pictures of cats, and it learns to identify cats because they've got ears like, and a little nose and the, the whiskers and all that, right? So we show it lots of pictures of cats, and we say, this is a picture of a cat, this is a picture of a cat, a picture of a cat, a picture of a cat, and it goes, right, got it, got it, I know where a cat is now, and you show it a picture of something else, and it goes, no, it's not a cat. You show it a picture of something else, it goes, no, a cat. A picture of a cat, and it goes, yep, that's a cat. Okay, so that's basically what we're going to do. Shall we have a quick neural network primer? Okay. This is a perceptron. I, I was trying to find, I, I didn't do any of my own diagrams for this, because if I'd done, I would have done a slightly simpler one. So, we talk about neural networks because the idea is that they're modeled on the neurons of your brain, but it's really, it's not a good, they're neurons in as much as they have inputs and an output, and you might wire them to something else, okay? So, we have this perceptron, we have a number of inputs, and each input has a weight associated with it. So we might regard this input as more important, so we give that a higher weight, and this one might be less important, so we give that a lower weight, so it might be 0.1, this might be 0.9. We've got some inputs coming in here, we weight them, so we, we scale them all slightly, then we add them up. We might also inject a bias value at this point, just an offset, one way or the other. We pass it through some thresholding function, and the output is, yeah, it's cat, or no, it's not a cat. Okay? Uh, and even just as with a simple perceptron, and this, this was an exercise I did at university, and probably if you did computer science, you might have done it as well, where you get just a plane of dots and you can bisect them into two just with a two input perceptron. And if you wire it one way, you can turn it into an AND gate, and if you wire it another way, you, you know, if you force it another way, you can turn it into an OR gate. But that's the essence of it. You've got some inputs, you apply some weighting to them, you add them up, and it's, it's one or the other. Um, in, I hesitate to say real neural networks, but in real neural networks you have more of these things and you might have a whole load of them which are then cross-connected to a whole load more, which cross-connected to a whole load more and eventually a, multi a number of outputs come out. They might be fed forward, you might skip some and you might feed some back again. So here's a slightly more complicated one. Typically the ones where you plug your inputs in are called the input layer the one where the, the outputs appear, they're called the output layer, and in the middle you have the hidden layer, because you can't see it, and you don't know what's going on in there. And there might actually be multiple layers, but they're all the hidden layer. And here, in this case, we're taking the output value and we're running it back into an earlier layer. So we've got some feedback in here. And this is a recurrent neural network. It's got an RNN, recurrent neural network, because the output now depends on the output before. And so they have, they have state, they have memory. And the amount of kind of state, and you, can, you, know, you can wire them differently to give them different amounts of state. But recurrent neural networks, because they have this memory, then they can work on time series, or series, event, time series events, and videos are time series. So, if I've got a video in my archive, 
it's a real video there. To make, to make this project even more exciting, the videos that we're using are uh, proceedings of the Supreme Court. So really difficult to train a neural network on because there are no jump cuts, there are no explosions, there are a lot of people talking to each other and they're all dressed in a very similar way. Okay, you know, if you want to train your Jason Statham, really easy to train a neural network on his films, but he is not important to the history of jurisprudence in this country. Um, so, what we can do is we're going to get a video of the Supreme Court and we're going to get a neural network to watch that video and get to really know that video. <laughs> right? And then if we show it a different video, it's going to go, no, that is not the video you, that is not the video you made me watch. And if I muck around with it, it's going to go, no, no, it's not. It's not the video that you showed me. But if I format shift it, it's going to go, oh yeah, no, that is the same one. Because what we're doing is we're characterising the content, not the raw bits. We're characterising what goes on in the video. No, this is why the computer vision people are involved, because we're looking at it, the content, not the raw bits. Um, and I'm uh, a little bit vague on the method because, uh, because I haven't been doing that work and because it's somebody's PhD and so they haven't, really, they haven't published anything yet. So it's all, but the, the basic method is to, we're using TensorFlow because everybody uses TensorFlow, right? That's the, the underlying library, the, yeah, the machine learning library. And so we slice, we take a video, we slice it into scenes and we gather those scenes into clusters and for each cluster, we train the neural network. So, uh, and each, what have we got? Typically, we might have between 10 and 50 scenes for a video, between two and five clusters. So we might get between two and five different neural nets trained, uh, or with each scene being between one and 10 minutes long. And for each minute of a scene, we produce what's, what they're calling content hash, which I assume is so if we if, if if we've got an RNN with a memory of about a minute, we're taking the output at that point. So then we can persist the neural network. We can gather up all the weights of all the neurons in the network and store them away alongside the values that we've got for this video. So that later on, if I give you a different version of this video, a reformatted version of the video, you can reconstitute that neural network because you know all the weights of all the neurons. You can shove the video through it, and this little blob then, it should sort of land in this little pale blob here, which is kind of like a multi-dimensional area in, in a state space, effectively. Because you've got, you've got the scenes, you've got what goes on in the scenes, you've got the clusters and all that. So if you change any of it, yeah, I'm getting there, don't worry. Um, then you're gonna, you, you know, normal hashes, you make a tiny change, it gives you a massively different value. This is going to wang you off somewhere else in hyperspace. That's the theory. Seems to be working. Problem is, it takes bloody ages to characterise neural networks. So we're working on that, um, I'm told. Anyway, so the project's still got another six to eight months to run. I don't know what's going to happen by then. Um, but ideally, at some ideal point, idealised point in the future, we'll have this cooperating uh, consortium of these memory archives around the world, and they are very interested. Actually, it's a, it is a genuine. This, is a, this may seem a bit after, It's a genuine problem that these people are trying to address. Uh, of these kind of cooperating archives, who are producing this this blockchain of of um, content metadata, which hopefully, hopefully, will mean that we can have a shift from a kind of solely institutional underscoring of the of the, of the trust that we have in them to one that's supported by technology, not replaced by one, supported by the technology, so that they can show that their records haven't been altered. You can see, in a way that you can't see at the moment, you can see the, the practice, the archival practice, and that they are collaborating with others. Because this kind of collaboration goes on uh, al already, um, but it's not generally talked about. For example, um, you might have heard about uh, when, the, the Iraq war, when the Iraq war kicked off, there was an effort by museums and things to transport um, artefacts out of uh, museums. Well, there's a similar effort, and there have been similar efforts, to retain and, and distribute those um, archives 
from, from countries that are under stress. <laughs> like that. So that kind of cooperation goes on already, but this would, this would uh, make that collaboration more publicly open. And so you can, so then they are all kind of supporting each other in that kind of institutional trust. One hopes. So, yeah, so maybe, maybe it'll make the world a little bit better. And you don't often get to say that about the work you're doing as a software engineer, so maybe. Uh, so, uh, thanks very much. That, that's it. That's my, my under my five minutes. So, uh, yeah, it's jolly good. So, uh, at any further questions? I appreciate that it's been like, very quick, very quick. Here's a quick primer on archival practice. Here's a quick primer on blockchain. Here's a quick thing on machine learning. So there's lots of things going on, but that's all right, fine. Um, I'll, I'll be here, as they say. So uh, thanks very much. If you are interested in small stuff, there's uh, a nice article about what we're doing. There's, uh, this is kind of, this is a much more technical uh, overview of what we're doing. There's actually the code we've got and that, that is the New York article. It's amazing. Did you, uh, someone tweeted about um, the, the flat Earth thing, and it's, it's the reason why we think it's uh, round is because the flat Earth is spinning at very high velocity. That makes it look like a globe. Oh no, the, these guys, they no, these guys are not. They don't think that. It might be disc shaped. These guys, because so the spinning disc guys, they're. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a quote in here somewhere about where they talk about the, those spinning. I can't, but it's just, it's just, it's not credible that the Earth is a disc spinning through space. He said that was what he said about the, the spinning disc guys. They're no, they're wackos. But us, <laughs> it's astonishing. It's really it's genuinely astonishing. It's even better than the time that the Guardian sent a guy to a Marillion weekend thing and. Uh, you know, at Blackpool or something, Blackpool Plans, but that was really good as well. It was kind of in, you know, it's like undercover with the Marillion fans. This is just astonishing. Anyway, oh, that, <laughs> thank you very much. So you, you said you were working with the fire service. Yes, I am. Yes, that's, that's how I knew to tell you to run away. If so, it was. I've got a badge and everything, but it says I'm not allowed to put out fires. I, 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 I suppose there's the, the angle of the fire service knows about things burning down and then burning down would be bad, and thus archival. Oh no, the, the two are unrelated. Right. The two are unrelated. I, by, I spend part of my week working for the fire service and part of the week working on the Archangel project. Gotcha. Uh, it is entirely by coincidence that all my income is currently derived from the public purse. Thank you all very much for that. Uh, slightly more, obviously, from the council taxpayers of, of the West Midlands. Um, but no, the, the two, are, two are unrelated, but uh, coincident. Uh, it is slightly weird that there's a fire service with the software development department. I mean, that's, that's odd. But it's nice to work somewhere with a clear organisational focus. Okay, so you don't, you don't rock up to the archives and go, that's a lovely archive you've got. Might catch fire. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 no. We have this wonderful software. No, so. no, it's entirely coincident that I'm entirely, uh, the, the two are entirely separate. So what I do at the fire service is they're all quite young. Or they're, uh, well, they're all younger than me, anyway. So... Um, I hang around and, and just, you know, uh, in, in some ways, um, I'm trying to emulate Russell, actually, because when I first came into ACU, when I first got to know Russell through ACU, he always seemed like that kind of enthusiastic granddad that you got in kids' telly. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> the, ones, the ones, you know, like, come on, kids. <laughs> Let's go for an adventure. No, right. No, come on, kids. Let's go for an adventure. Watch for the old mine shaft. You know, and you were like that with like build systems, or you were, you were, you know, you were telling us to use Groovy. Like about two weeks after Groovy was invented, right? And everyone was like, "What the fuck are you on, Russell?" Just <laughs> and now, right? We go, "Oh yeah, Russell, he was right." What's he banging on about now? Oh, maybe I should have a look at that. So that's that's the kind of that's the model that I've adopted, right? So I have to be the uh, simultaneously world weary but enthusiastic with them. And it's it's really good fun actually. When when you when you all get a bit older, you might want to give it a try. It's great. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. You be, uh, no, you, you to carry it off, you've got to be a bit greyer. It's coming. I think it will be. No one can tell with Justin Mangel, unless you've been going grey for quite a long time and then come into the office with jet black hair. Mm. 
<laughs> then everyone can spot it. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs>